Who knows? So, good morning. Um, I posted Fundamentals Part 4, which is what we'll plug through uh, this week, and that'll be the end of the Fundamentals. So this week, uh, we will finish uh, Fundamentals and called it Part 4. Which includes inequalities, which is section 1.8. Uh, and then it's going to be, we're going to talk about lines, which will be a nice break after inequalities. We'll see, we'll, we'll tackle inequalities today. Um, and you'll see that it's quite a bit of work. Um, and then lines will be nice and breezy. Uh, oops, 1.10, sorry. And then, uh, shoot, I can't remember what 1.11 is called. We kind of breeze over it. I think it's called graphing or something like that. Um, uh, solving using graphs. We'll kind of breeze through it a little bit. And as we do, uh, 1.10, I might incorporate some of this 1.11, so we won't, might not do it explicitly. Uh, I'll kind of bake these two together, but today we'll do inequalities, uh, and then that'll be the end of our fundamentals. So after all these fundamentals, we've spent a lot of time on this, right? And that's a good thing because now we're heading into, uh, and we'll all have a, a pretty strong background having seen all this before. Um, and having pretty recent practice. So, uh, so we'll finish fundamentals and then next week, next week, uh, we don't meet on Monday, but Monday is Thanksgiving, so there's no school. But we meet on Tuesdays. So Tuesday, we're going to do a review for test number one. We just want to make sure. So I'll go through some of the harder problems with you guys. I'll post the practice test. Uh, so you'll have a really good idea of how I expect you to do it from the practice test and what I expect you to know. Um, we'll, we'll get a chance to go through some of the trickier problems, right? Um, not all of the problems, but a lot of them and I'll post the solutions of course so it's not like a big deal um, but I'll also really make sure that everyone's on the same page with uh, how do you submit your test how do you uh, show all your work how do you do all this stuff right and we'll we'll do that in the review which is the day before the test and then on Thursday we said you've got your test number one during class time. So, like I uh, kind of was saying earlier, uh, another class of mine has a test this week. In fact, it's tomorrow. Ooh, scary for them. Uh, so, so they're going to have that test and they're kind of my guinea pigs. And uh, we'll see how that format goes. And then if it works, I'll use it for you guys as well. Uh, they're using WebAssign as well. So uh, it might be a nice transfer. If it really does not work at all, then I'll figure something else out for you guys. So it's nice that you guys have your test next week and not, not in the same week. Uh, but anyways, so that's kind of where we're headed. Uh, let's talk a little bit, uh, let's summarize what we did last day. Now, can I remember what we did last day? Uh, oh. We talked about uh, rational expressions and algebraic expressions. We 
we talked about specifically multiplying and dividing, um, multiplying and dividing um, <clears throat> rational expressions, right? So if we've got a, a fraction over a fraction, but those fractions all have polynomials in them, then it's a lot of work, but um, usually we end up factoring and things simplify quite a bit. So we talked about uh, compound fractions. What else did we talk about? Now I can't remember exactly because it was a while ago. Um, but we talked about rationalizing, rationalizing the numerator or the denominator. Usually we, we rationalize the denominator uh, more often than the numerator. So I'll start with rationalizing the denominator or numerator. And how did we do that? We use the conjugate, right? And so uh, using the conjugate. So go back and review those if those aren't, aren't sounding very familiar. You guys are here, you were here last day, so you guys are fine. Um, we're talking to people watching the video later. That's you. Um, okay, so that's where we kind of left off. Let's get into inequalities. So there are a lot of ins and outs about inequalities that we need to keep track of. Um, Starting on a fresh page here. Inequalities. <clears throat> so, so far, what I've said is, okay, if you're, if you're dealing with an inequality, you can just treat it as an equal sign, right? An inequality is a less than or greater than, less than or equal to, greater than or equal to, right? So as soon as you have that inequality, you can just treat it as an equal sign. That's true for the most part, except, and so today we're gonna to introduce those, those exceptions and look at those exceptions and how do we deal with them, okay? So, uh, so far, we have, um, no, I'll, I'll own what I said. So far, I have told you to treat, missing an R there, to treat inequalities as if they are equal signs. This is true for the most part, for the most part, except Uh, sorry, we've got a, like a city guy walking around in our yard. It's really weird. Just pretend I'm not here. It's really hard to do because um, turn you guys around here. There's windows everywhere. <laughs> I'm on display. He knows I'm here. All right. I'm not sure what he's doing. Uh, so, okay, so, um, so this is true for the most part, except, and the, the big one that we need to keep in mind is if we're multiplying or dividing, dividing is essentially multiplying, and you'll see why in a sec, but um, if you're multiplying or dividing by a negative number, then you have to switch the sign, okay? So the number one thing to keep in mind is that if you are multiplying or dividing, 
by a negative number on both sides of the inequality, of course, on both sides of the inequality, we need to, and I'll put kind of switch in, um, in quotes because it's not really a term, but you have to switch the sign. Okay. This one's really important. So for example, if we're saying something like two is less than four, that's true, right? But if I multiply both sides by negative two, right? Two times negative two and four times negative two, well, this becomes negative four and this becomes negative eight. Remember on a number line, right? Four is actually greater than, or sorry, negative four is actually greater than negative eight, right? And so we have to switch this sign for it to stay true. Okay. So you go from less, so two is less than four, but as soon as you multiply or divide by a negative number, the sign has to switch. And so uh, from here on out, when you're dealing with inequalities, as soon as you're multiplying or dividing, I want you to uh, kind of build that check-in point. Is it a negative number? If so, you have to switch the sign right away. Otherwise, um, your inequality will be false, right? Negative four is greater than negative eight, right? And so uh, you want to be really careful with that. This is definitely the most important thing to keep in mind for inequalities, there is another one, uh, another scenario where you have to switch the sign. But for most problems, this is the one that we need to need to uh, keep in mind. The second one is if you take the reciprocal of both sides of an inequality, then the sign switches. So the reciprocal is one over something. Hey, my printer's doing something weird again. It's a place, right? Uh, didn't it do something weird in one of our other lectures too? I feel like it was us. Um, anyways, creepy. Uh, if you take the reciprocal of both sides, you need to switch the inequality or switch the sign. For example, again, let's take two is less than four, <clears throat> but if I take one over two, that's one half, one over two is actually greater than one over four. Oops, wrong color. Right? One half is larger than one quarter. A little bit harder to wrap your head around, right? This one's easier to see, uh, but it, it, the same thing happens for reciprocals as well. So uh, the reciprocal of two is one over two. <coughs> so the second one doesn't happen as often, right? Um, but I mean, it does happen. So all the rules for inequalities, all the rules for inequalities are summarized below. And I'm going to go into our notes, fundamentals part four. And there's some notes about inequalities here, but the rules for inequalities are here. Okay. So we'll just talk about these, right? Uh, I'll just highlight that these are the ones that we talked about above, right? Four and five. 
So let's just talk about these and, and you'll notice that those two are the only time that the sign changes. So if it is less than B or less than or equal to, I'll just do less than, less than or equal to A. So if we add a value to both sides, the inequality stays the same, right? If two is less than four, which it is, then two plus one is still less than four plus one. We've just shifted over one. Same thing if we subtract a value from both, from both sides, then it's still the inequality stays the same. If I multiply by some positive value, so if a C is greater than zero, if I multiply both sides by C, the inequality stays intact. The only time is if the C is negative, so if C is less than zero, then, uh, then the inequality reverses, right? So then we have to switch the inequality and then uh, here's the reciprocal. So if A is greater than zero and B is greater than zero, so we've got two positive numbers, then A, if A is less than B, then one over A is greater than one over B. And then same thing, if we know that A is less than B and C is less than D, if I do A plus C, that must be less than B plus D. Right. As long as I keep things on the same side of the inequality, I can add them um, and it, it'll still work. Right. And if you say this last one in your mind, you'll say, oh yeah, well, of course, if A is less than B and B is less than C, then what we can say is that A must be less than C. If A is less than B and B is less than C, then A must be less than C. So we call that inequ uh, inequalities are transitive, right? They're able to, to transfer through like that, which is just kind of, uh, it makes sense, but here it is on paper, right? So the only two where it switches signs we've already talked about, right? But here they are kind of summarized neatly. Yeah. So, if we're solving inequalities, right, really what we're doing is we're solving for x, right? We want to get x on one side and then probably some value on the other side and we're going to work with inequalities, right? And so we're going to work through a couple of these. And there's some notes in there, but they're just all the things that we've already talked about. So don't don't worry, you can go back and read them later. So if we're solving a linear inequality, a linear inequality just means that there's only uh, one value of x, right? So, or uh, degree one is what I meant to say. All right, so the highest power of x is zero. Um, so if we're trying to solve it really means solve for x and a linear inequality means that the highest power, the highest power of x is one. Okay. <clears throat> So looking here, right, there might be multiple values of x here, right, 4x and 9x, but we're able to group them. We can collect like terms, and then our highest value or our highest power of x is still 1. Whereas if you go to the next page, we'll look at nonlinear inequalities in a little bit. Um, but for now, we'll just start with uh, linear inequalities. Okay. So let's start off. <laughs> the first one that has kind of X's on both sides. Uh, well, let's do 15 first. Let's start off nice and slow. So 15, if we've got 2X minus 5 is greater than 3. Remember to have a little stopper in your mind if you're multiplying or dividing, just to make sure that it's not a negative number, right? 
But in order to solve for x, I want to get x on its own if I can add it to the uh, thing. So I want to try to get x on its own, which means first thing I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to add 5 to both sides. So I've got 2x minus 5 plus 5. That's how I get it to go away. But then if I'm adding 5 to both sides, I just need to check in. I don't need to change the sign so it stays the same. Right, and so I've got 2x, and for now, right, we're starting really slow, so I'm going to show all my work. You don't have to show this step. You could just go to 2x is greater than 3 plus 5. I'll show it in the same color so it's, you can see where it came from. But negative minus 5 plus 5 makes 0, so 2x plus 0. But if you just went to 2x is greater than 8, that's totally fine by me. So now, to solve for x, all I have to do is divide both sides by 2, right? So I can divide by 2, check in point, right, 2, positive value of 2, so I don't have to change the sign, so that's nice. And so now what I've get, got is 2 divided by 2 makes 1. So now I've got x is greater than 8 divided by 2 is 4. <laughs> what we're going to do is it asks us to uh, express the solution using interval notation and graph the solution set. So I'm going to graph it on a number line. Um, so interval notation, so the solution in interval notation, maybe I'll put this down here. In interval notation, if x has to be greater than 4 but not equal to 4, we would start at 4 and go all the way to infinity. Right, round bracket because it's not equal to 4, and then it has to just be greater, so we go all the way to infinity. And then on a graph, here we'll do a number line. I'll have 4 somewhere here. And there's my solution. So, good. The nice thing about solving inequalities is if you're saying, okay, well, x has to be any value greater than 4. Well, what you're saying is as long as x is greater than 4 here, this statement has to be true, right? And so uh, you can always check your answers, and, and especially in the beginning, if you're not feeling confident in your answer, right, did I forget to switch the sign, for example, then you can check your work by just picking a value of x that's greater than 4, right, something in the solution, and plugging it into this inequality, the original inequality, and make sure that it's a true statement. All right. So we can check our work. by using a value of x, by using a value of x from the solution, right, in this case, x has to be greater than 4, can't be equal to 4, right, so, um, here, uh, you know what, I'll save this. I'll write out the general version first. So we can check our work by using a value of x from the solution uh, to make sure the original inequality is a true statement. So in our case, right, the solution was x has to be greater than 4.
So I'll let x be 5, how about? That's not greater than 4. You can pick any value greater than 4, as long as it's in the solution. Um, in the original equation, which was 2x minus 5 has to be greater than 3. Right, that's from the very beginning here. 2x minus 5 has to be greater than 3. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to plug in 2 times 5 minus 5. Is it greater than 3? 10 minus 5 is 5. 5 is greater than 3, which is true. So it is a solution. Okay. Let's do one that's a little bit harder and then we'll do one that's a little bit harder still. So let's do 21, which I've already underlined. And then finally, we'll do 36 here. Oof, yikes, right? Yikes, yikes, yikes. So we'll do 21. It's a little warm up, not so little. 4x minus seven, has to be less than 8 plus 9x. So now all my x's, uh, well, I've got 4x here and 9x here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to bring things, uh, all my x's to one side. So just as if it's an equal sign, right? Uh, I'm trying to collect all my x's, collect all my numbers, and then slowly try to get x on its own. So what I'm going to do is, and it doesn't really matter, but I'm going to move this 9x over to uh, the left-hand side, mostly to illustrate uh, what to do with that negative, right? Because looking at this, I can see that bringing this 9x, I would have to subtract 9x. So then I've got 4 minus 9x. And so that's the reason that I'm doing that. But that's for me. Um, you you can avoid the negative by bringing the 4x to the right-hand side, but I just want to illustrate the negative. So uh, collect like terms. And solve for x. Right, that's what we're going to do here. So I'm going to do itty bitty baby steps here. And I'm first going to move this 9x over to the left-hand side, and then I'm going to move this 7 over to the right-hand side. Um, you can do that in one step if you want to, right? It just depends on how comfortable you're feeling, but I just want to show you where everything is going, uh, at least now in the beginning. So we've got 4x minus 7, and then I'm going to just highlight to move this plus 9x over to the other side, I have to subtract 9x from both sides. I'm only subtracting the same value from both sides, so it stays the same 9x, and that's how it goes away. You do not need to show this if you don't want to. Right, I'm showing it because I'm trying to illustrate what's going on here, right? Um, but you don't need to show that. As long as you show this, that's fine. So then what I have to do is I have to move this uh, minus seven over to the right-hand side, which means I have to add seven to both sides. So now I've got four X minus nine X, because I'm also sneakily gonna, well, Maybe that was too much. Minus seven minus nine X, and I'll use a different color. Plus seven has to be less than eight plus seven. Okay. Negative seven plus seven goes away. So now I've got 4x minus 9x has to be less than or equal to 8 plus 7, which is 15. And whenever you're doing this stuff, I encourage you to use a calculator, right? Even if it's silly stuff like 8 plus 7, just make sure that it's 15 because it, things can really, really 
um, go wrong fast, downhill fast. So just be careful. So now, trying to solve for x, right? I'm gonna uh, use my coefficients, however you wanna think about it. You're technically pulling out a common x to, to be able to combine these coefficients, or you can just say 4x minus 9x. Well, that's four minus nine, oops, sorry. Uh, four minus nine, which is negative five x. So now here, I'm left with negative five x must be less than 15. Here is what I mean, because in order to get x on its own, I have to divide by negative five. Now I'm dividing by a negative number, which means I have to switch the sign, right? So that's the reason I, I did this example the way I did. Um, so now I'm dividing by negative five on both sides, which means, whoops, I'll do it in red. I have to switch the sign. Right. So here, right, negative five over negative five makes one. So now I've got x is greater than 15 over negative five, which should be negative three. especially if you've had to switch the sign, right? Um, and maybe I'll make it red still, just to highlight and I'll make this look like an inequality. There. Just to highlight that it did switch, right? Um, especially if you've had to switch the sign, uh, I would recommend that you, you go through and you check your work Right, and so first we can write out our solution because I'm feeling pretty confident. Our solution on an interval, right, with interval notation, x has to be greater than but not equal to negative three. So from negative three all the way up to infinity or on a graph or a number line, we would have something like negative three, not including negative three, but going all the way up. Okay. So now, check your solution. Check your solution, which um, right, if, if we have to have a value that's greater than negative three, right, a nice value that's greater than negative three is zero, for example, right, totally, it's, it should be a solution, so it should work, right, um, I'll put it on the same page, let x equal zero, for example, in your original equation, keeping it the way it was, right, no more rearranging, 4x minus 7 has to be less than 8 plus 9x. So, oops, 4x minus 7, is it less than 8 uh, plus 9x? If I let x be 0, I've got 4 times 0 minus 7 has to be less than 8 plus 9 times 0 negative seven is less than eight, so it is a solution. You can pick harder values of x to plug in, uh, but you'll find the same thing, right? So, good. So it's a good idea to get in the habit of checking your solution, um, at least until we're more comfortable. Right? with inequalities. No one likes inequalities. I don't even like inequalities, but uh, because, probably because they make us work for it a little bit. There. How about we do that big mumbo jumbo, the 36. So if we go back up here, I've picked out 36 for us to do together.
36. Hooey. Negative 1 over 2 has to be less than or equal to 4 minus 3x divided by 5, which has to be less than or equal to 1 over 4. All right. As long as you do everything to all the sides of the inequality, you'll be safe, right? So as long as, as long as you manipulate all sides of the inequality, while isolating x, you'll be safe. While isolating, because the whole goal, right, is to try to solve for x, what is x in between? Um, we know that 4 minus 3x over 5 is between negative 1 half and 1 quarter, but we want to know in terms of x, right? So as long as you manipulate all sides of the inequality while isolating x, you will be safe. Well, that's kind of an evil looking smiley face. There you go. So I'll write this out again. We've got negative one half has to be less than or equal to four minus three x over five, which has to be less than or equal to one over four. Okay. Okay. I'm trying to solve for x here, right? Treating both of these as an equal sign for now, even though we know we can't really, as long as we're, um, as long as we're not dividing or multiplying by a negative, we're safe, right? So especially when we start, we're going to move this 5 over. So what that means, I'm going to have to multiply each side by 5. In fact, I'll show that here, times 5, times 5, times 5, right? That's how I'm going to cancel these. We've seen this before, right? Negative 1 over 2 times 5 is technically a fraction times a fraction, so 5 over 1, but we just multiply across, right? So this becomes negative 5 over 2 has to be less than or equal to 4 minus 3x, which has to be less than or equal to 5 over 4. So far so good because I'm multiplying by a positive value, right? So the sign stays the same, right? I don't need to change it. If I'm trying to isolate x, the next thing I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to multiply, or sorry, uh, subtract 4 from both sides. Ugh. Um, right, so next thing I have to do is I have to subtract 4 from both sides. Minus 4, minus 4. 4 minus 4 goes away. So now I've got negative 5 over 2 minus 4, right? Technically 4 over 1, if you want to see it there. I'm going to delete that now. Which has to be less than or equal to negative 3x, which has to be less than or equal to 5 over 4 minus 4. I was just subtracting 4 from both sides, so I don't need to switch the sign. Not until here, right? I can, I can see a, a sign switch coming my way. Um, but for now, I'm dealing with fractions, right? Negative 5 over 2 minus 4 over 1. I need a common denominator, right, in order to combine these on both sides, right? They're going to have different common denominators. Um, but I need to multiply this 4 by 2 over 2 and this 4 by 4 over 4 to get that common denominator. Need common denominator. So 
So we use those fraction rules a lot, right? So you need to really be uh, good at those. This becomes negative five over two minus eight over two, and you can check in with yourself, right? Four is eight over two, the same as four, yes it is. Is less than or equal to negative three x, less than or equal to five over four minus 16 over four. Again, 16 divided by four is four, so it, it checks out. But then I'm able to combine these because now I've got this common denominator. So, I, <laughs> Again, definitely use your calculator. Even like the slightest error here is going to really mess up your results. So um, I, I really want you to use a calculator here. So negative 5 minus 8 is negative 13. Oops. Negative 13 divided by 2. And if you have a, a fun calculator or something like this one, it'll give you the exact results and it will reduce it. Um, and that's what tells me that um, that's reduced because it just gave me negative 13 over 2. I want these answers in exact form. We talked about exact form. Exact form is the, is the fraction, right? I do not want the decimal. Sometimes it's easier to think about the decimal, and that's okay, uh, but I want the, the fraction. Less than or equal to negative 3x less than or equal to 5 minus 16 is negative 11 divided by 4. If I do that on my calculator, it just gives me negative 11 over 4, so I know that it's reduced. Here, this is the exact value. Do not use decimals. But I'll put in brackets, except to check your work, right? Uh, except to check your work. Because sometimes it's hard to think about fractions and what they actually look like. So then it's nice to convert them into uh, the approximate values. And then uh, you can use it to check your work. Okay? But I, I want them as these exact values. So we're so close. To get x on its own, all I have to do is divide both sides by negative 3. Right? So I have to divide both sides by negative 3. In fact, I'm going to write this all out. Negative 13 over 2 has to be less than or equal to negative 3x, which has to be less than or equal to negative 11 over 4. So I need to divide by negative 3. Dividing by negative 3 is the same as multiplying by 1 over negative 3. Right? So that's why I said earlier uh, I made a little comment saying, well, dividing is multiplying, right? And so, um, so this is what I mean, right? If you haven't seen it before, dividing is just multiplying, right? Multiplying by 1 over whatever you're wanting to divide by. And so here times 1 over negative 3 dividing is just multiplying by 1 over negative 3. Maybe I'll just say dividing by negative 3 is just multiplying by neg uh, 1 over negative 3. Because negative 3 over negative 3 cancels. And here I'm multiplying fractions, so I'm allowed to just multiply across and multiply across. So what I'm left with is I have negative 13 divided by 2 times negative 3, which is negative 6, has to be less than or equal to but, what did I forget? I forgot to switch the sign. Eek! So you just switch it because of this, I'm dividing by negative. 
or multiplying by a negative, it doesn't matter. Right, so I have to switch the sign from what it was to, to the opposite, essentially. So this becomes, how could I forget? Oh, I got so caught up in it. Greater than or equal to x, which has to be, and I'll do it in red just to highlight, greater than or equal to negative 11 times 1 is negative 11, 4 times negative 3 is negative 12. A negative over a negative makes a positive, right? And same thing, a negative over a negative makes a positive again. And so we've got, uh, and if you do 13 divided by six, that's reduced. So 13 divided by six is greater than or equal to X, which is greater than or equal to, and 11 divided by 12 is also gonna be reduced. So this, is uh, this is the solution, right? Typically, we like having inequalities like this. So the smallest value, the middle value, the largest value, right? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna rewrite this um, in that order. So this is the solution. But we usually write inequalities from smallest to largest. Which means, well, if x has to be greater than 11 over 2, but also has to be less than 13 over 6, what I'm going to have is I've got 11 over sorry, 11 over 12, I don't know why I said two, has to be less than or equal to x, which has to be less than or equal to 13 over six. Now, here's what I mean by it's hard to, to kind of check to see if this even makes sense without using the approximations. use decimal approximations only to confirm that your solution makes sense. Right, so 11 over 12 as a decimal is roughly 0.916 repeating, is that less than or equal to 13 divided by six, which is 2.16 repeating? Yes, it is, so it makes sense, okay. And then what you're gonna do to check your work, so here, this is your solution, right, in the exact form. Here, you're just making sure it makes sense, what you're saying, it does, right? This is less than this. And so now what you're gonna do is you're gonna pick a value of x in between this, so 0.916 and 2.16. Um, let's let x be one, one is somewhere in here, right? So one should give me a true statement in that original inequality. x equals one is in the solution. So we use it to check our work. Okay. So our original statement was negative one half has to be less than or equal to four minus three X over five, which has to be less than or equal to one over four. So when I plug in x equals one in here, the result should be somewhere between negative one half and one, one over four, otherwise I've done something wrong. So this is 
negative one half has to be less than or equal to four minus three times one over five. Four minus three is three, uh, sorry, four minus three times one is three times one is three. So four minus three is one, one over five. Let's just use decimal approximations to make sure that this makes sense. It looks good to me, right? Uh, just from what I know about fractions, um, but it can be hard to see, right? And so um, here, right? Negative one over two is negative 0.5. One over five is 0.2, which is less than or equal to 0.25, which makes sense, which means that this is a true statement. So we've got it, the solution where we want it. Right? Our solution makes sense. Whew. That's a biggie. Any questions about that one? Uh, oh yeah, so here what we're saying is that any value between 11 over 12 and 13 over 6 is going to work. So, uh, so that's what we mean by all of these are solutions. And so what we do is, because 11 over 12, it's hard to imagine what that is. So you can pick any value between 0.916 and 2.16 and it'll still work. Right? So yeah, you could absolutely use 1.5 if you wanted to, uh, but I tend to use whatever the most convenient value of x is. Right? I don't want to have to deal with one and a half. I'd rather deal with one. You could even use two, right? Two is in this interval as well. Um, yeah, so once you've established your your range, you're just picking one value in that range, um, plugging it in just to check to make sure that this statement is still true, right? And you can, you can plug in a couple of test values in here, but the statement should stay true. Yeah, so that's just to make sure that you've got your, uh, to check your work, essentially. <laughs> Good, cool, 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 cool. So, uh, there's more on there for you to practice, but we're going to move to solving nonlinear inequalities. So those were linear inequalities. Sorry, I'm just, my, uh, my throat gets trained throughout the term uh, to talking a bunch, but uh, because I teach a class right before you guys, I've been talking for two hours already saying the same thing. But I feel like you guys get a better version because it's my second run through. Quicker at least, um, often, in a good way. So if we're solving nonlinear inequalities, nonlinear inequalities, so we said linear inequalities are when the highest power of x is one, right? Nonlinear inequalities, are when the highest power of x is greater than one. So we'll stick to powers of two, right, quadratics, um, unless we've got something that's nice and factored like this, then we can probably, we can still deal with that, right? Um, but we're just gonna work with quadratics and you'll see why in a sec and, uh, and factored things like this. So, to solve nonlinear inequalities, oh, got a little pencil on there. 
So nonlinear inequalities are when, when the highest power of x is greater than 1. So when the highest power of x is greater than 1. Unless it's nice and factored, we'll stick to quadratics. So we will stick to quadratics, which have the form ax squared plus bx plus c, unless it's nice and, and factored, unless uh, the nonlinear inequality is already nicely factored. Oops, inequality is already nicely factored. Something like x plus x plus d, let's say, times x plus e times x plus f, right? Here, if we expanded this, our highest power of x would be 3. Uh, is there a, uh, because the, I have to lie in that range, say if x is greater than 0. Yeah. Uh, so that's, we're going to spend a lot of time just figuring out how to solve these things. So uh, don't worry, Vaughn, we'll, we will get there. <laughs> but we're going to develop some um, just kind of methodology for how do we show that things are greater than 0. Okay. The key thing is um, to remember what uh, because we're going to focus on quadratics and then the same sort of thing will we'll transfer but to higher powers. But uh, <laughs> yeah, just a little bit ahead of yourself. That's okay. That's good. That's good. Um, don't worry. We'll get there. Uh, so if you have a quadratic, a quadratic in general looks like this. A quadratic in general looks like either like this, something like that, right? Parabola facing up, or it can be a parabola facing down. Whoop. Okay. So and these are axes, these are the roots, my nib is falling off, and these are the roots. We know how to find the roots, right? We find the roots using the quadratic formula. We find the roots of quadratics using the quadratic formula. Right? Which is x is negative b plus minus the square root of b squared minus oops, 4ac. over 2a. Okay. So that's, this is how we find x and x, right? y equals 0 for both of these, right? Because that's what we're forcing. And so um, that's why we always get two values, right? Um, at least for the problems that we're doing. We're not going to deal with no solutions. Are, although, just as a quick, I'm going to delete this after. But if you have a parabola that looks like this, right, there are no solutions. 
So that can happen, right? That there are no solutions, but for us, we're just gonna deal with solutions. So don't worry about that. Okay. <laughs> we're gonna use those solutions, okay? Or we're gonna use the roots. The roots are solutions. Um, we're gonna use the roots to figure out where this thing is positive or negative, right? So if you have a glance at, I don't think I brought the questions over quite yet, right? But if we have a glance at some of these, the goal is gonna be to figure out where things are less than zero, greater than or equal to zero, right? Great, uh, less than or equal to zero. So how they compare to zero is really saying, is it positive or is it negative, right? So here, what we're really trying to find is uh, where is x minus five times x plus four greater than or equal to zero which is positive or equal to zero, right? So we're really trying to figure out where things are positive. Sorry, my dog's stomach is like grumbling like crazy. You okay? Huh? You okay? She's an old dog, so she can get a little bit weird sometimes. Okay, sorry. Um, she usually just sleeps through all our lectures. She usually lays right behind the screen. Oh yeah, there she is. Um, okay, so really what we're trying to figure out here is where is this thing positive, right? And so what we do is we don't need to know what it looks like if it's facing up or facing down, right? But we need to be able to find the roots, which we can easily do, right? If it's already factored, we know that the roots are at x equals five and x equals negative four, right? So we would have something like negative four and five here, right? Something that looks like this. And where is it gonna be greater than or equal to zero? Well, the result is greater than or equal to zero if it has this shape in this region. So everything up to negative four, here it's all negative, and then everything after is positive again. And so after positive five, okay. So uh, we'll develop a way that we can we can do this even if, um, even if we don't have the roots handed to us like this, right? We'll have to find the roots and then we can do it. Uh, but we're gonna do what we just did, right? Looking at this thing, but we'll, gonna, we'll use math instead, right? And to figure out, okay, where is this thing positive? Where is it negative? Using the roots as kind of cutoff points, okay? And so here, let's see here. I'll bring in the, the guidelines for how do we solve this thing. But a lot of the time, you'll see that a lot of this stuff is already done for us, right? So the first thing we wanna do is because we're concerned about how it relates to zero, that's the easiest thing to look at. Where is this thing positive? Where is it negative? Uh, so you'll want to move all the terms over so that you've got zero on one side of the inequality, right? And so, um, so that's going to be your first step, right? Move all the terms so that the zero is on one side and everything else is on the other side. Then you're going to factor unless it's already factored for you, right? Here in the beginning, it's already factored, but also here later, Right, things are already factored for you. So 
Uh, so that's what makes these doable, right? At least for us. So in the beginning here, these ones, they're already factored. So you've already got steps one and two done for you. Um, then you're gonna find the intervals. Okay, so the intervals, um, you're gonna find the roots. And then, so that's where the values of each factor is zero, right? So here, find the roots. And then you're gonna set up a number line with the roots on it um, and just kind of figure out which intervals. So you'll have uh, your, your number line broken up by the roots and then uh, you can make a table or a diagram. I actually like a table sort of better. I put a table underneath my number line and you'll see how that looks. Um, and then we, all we care about is the sign of uh, the product of the factors, right? And so we don't care about the actual value. We care about the sign. Is it positive? So is it above the x-axis or is it negative? Is it below the x-axis? And then uh, we can just use the sign table. So once we've developed that and we've seen one or two, then you'll know what this kind of means uh, a little bit better. All right, without further ado, let's do, let's start off nice and slow at 37 because we already talked about 38, um, but let's do 37. 37 says that x plus 2 times x minus 3 has to be less than 0. So it can't be equal to 0, but it has to be less than 0. Running through our checklist here, all the terms are on one side. I've got 0 on the other side. Good. This is already factored, so that's done for me as well, right? Um, so now I need to find the roots. So here, my roots are x equals negative 2 and x equals positive 3, right? If I plug in negative 2 here, I get 0. And if I plug in x equals positive 3, I get 0. So it's on the uh, x-axis, right? And so those are our roots. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to plug these on a number line, right? So find the intervals. So I've got negative two and three. Those are my roots. And I'm going to put them on a number line. So I've got this number line here. Keeps going and going. And I'm going to leave a little bit of room here at negative two and three. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take these values and I'm gonna pretend to put in any value that's to the left of negative two, right? And you can, you can pick an actual value or you can just pretend to put in some value because all we care about is the sign, right? Is it positive or is it negative? If you plug in any one of these values and how the roots behave is everything to the left of negative two will behave the same way. Everything between negative two and three behaves the same way. And everything to the right of three behaves the same way. So as long as, um, cause that's kind of a hard concept to kind of get on board with, but I'm telling you that that's how it is. And so what we'll see is what, uh, we'll kind of, for now, I'm gonna pick a test value. So here, this is a test value. x equals mm, negative four. Negative four is somewhere there. x equals, uh, well, my favorite test value, something between negative two and three. Why not zero? Why not? Because we can is a reason to do it. Um, anything greater than three, x equals five, let's say, right? These test values, I'm just picking a number because it's easier 
then to think of, okay, if it's less than two, um, it's easier to plug in x equals negative four to act on behalf of everything in this range. Using x equals zero to act on behalf of everything between negative two and three, and same thing with x equals five. So sometimes I use these numbers, sometimes I just use them as a crutch. Um, and so here, I'm gonna put this all on a new page here, because I want, later in the notes, I want them all on the same page. So, kind of visually, I divide up my page, and I'll explain what I'm doing here, because I've got a little bit of space here. So, what we're gonna do is we need to find the sign of this uh, of x plus two times x minus three, is it less than zero or not, right? So we need to find the sign, and I'll do a sign, either it's positive or negative, of x plus two times x minus three, uh, on all sides of the roots. A number line with test values help us do that. Hey, perfect room. So what we're going to do is, right, I want to figure out what the sign of this thing is. So in each of these little um, areas, right, I've got three areas, I need to figure out if it's positive or negative. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to have x plus 2 times x minus 3, x plus 2 times x minus 3, x plus 2 times x minus 3. Right. <clears throat> How does it behave on the left hand side of negative 2? So if it's less than negative 2, I'm using negative 4. You can pick any value less than negative 2. Um, but I'm not going to evaluate it at x equals negative 4. And that's kind of the hard part. You can to figure out if you get a positive or, or negative number. But eventually, you're going to get so fast at this and looking at, okay, if I plug in negative 4 plus 2, that gives me a negative number, right? And so here, what you're going to end up looking like is you get this negative number, negative 4 minus 3 gives me another negative number. It doesn't matter if it's negative 4 or negative 40, as long as it's to the left of negative 2 or less than negative 2, right? I get a negative value here and a negative value here. A negative times a negative makes a positive, right? And so overall, my result is positive. Negative times a negative equals a positive. So the result is positive, meaning that the line is above the x-axis, right? So all our y's are, are positive. Now, I suspect that because it's a quadratic, this should be a negative result, right? But I'm just going to use x equals 0 as kind of a crutch and to figure out if, uh, if x is 0, then 0 plus 2 makes a positive value. 0 minus 3 makes a negative value, which positive times a negative makes a negative, right? <clears throat> Do the same thing with x equals 5 or something to the right of 3, anything to the right of 3. So as long as x is greater than 3, we've got uh, 5 plus 2 is positive, 5 minus 3 is positive, so overall, I have a positive result. Okay. 
So what this looks like, right? I want to know where is it less than zero, right? So I want this negative result, right? Less than zero means it's going to be a negative. So this is the only time this region satisfies the inequality that x plus 2 times x minus 3 is less than 0. This region does not satisfy and does not satisfy because we're getting positive numbers. Okay. Graphically, graphically, we would have something like this, right? We set our roots, oops. Our roots were negative two and positive three. Here, I've got a positive result, positive and negative in between. So what this thing looks like must be something like this. Positive, negative, positive. So the solution as uh, an interval notation, the solution was when x is between negative two and positive three, right, the inequality is satisfied. So what we say in interval notation is that if we go from negative two up to three, not including the endpoints, because we wanted the inequality to be less than zero, right? Not less than or equal to. You would have square brackets if it was equal to the, uh, the zeros or the roots. Okay. Good. Uh -oh. So a little bit harder than linear inequalities, right? But as long as you remember the shape of a quadratic is just a parabola, whether it's facing up or facing down, then it's going to be easier to think, okay, um, I need to figure out where things are positive, where things are negative, and depending on what the inequality is in terms of zero, Right? Do you want it to be positive or do you want it to be negative? In this case, we wanted it to be negative. So we're trying to find the regions that make it negative. Right? Let's do 42. Just for an example where we have to factor first, right? Factoring gives us the roots, uh, but also the quadratic formula gives us the roots and then we use the roots to get the factors. So um, we can use them kind of interchangeably and move around like that. So I'll show you how to do it. 42. Um, x squared plus 5x plus 6, we want it to be greater than 0. Okay. So, oh. If we have something like this, right, we've got a quadratic. First thing we want to check is, okay, we've got zero on the one side. So if I didn't have zero, I'd have to collect all my terms on one side uh, and get zero on its own over here. But I've already got that, so that's good. That's one step done. I don't have this factored, but I can use the quadratic formula use the quadratic formula to find the roots. And 
second factor if you want to, right? Easy enough. Now that we know how to use the quadratic formula to factor, um, but really what we're looking for are the roots. So in our case, right, we've got a is 1, b is 5, and c is 6. We're getting hopefully better at using the quadratic formula. So x is negative b plus minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2a. So x is going to be negative 5 plus minus the root of 5 squared minus 4 times 1 times 6. Hey, nice over two times one, I get x is negative five plus minus 25 minus 24 is one. Uh, we are doing 42. From the notes. Dink. This one. Uh, oh yeah, so 5 squared is 25 minus 24 makes 1. The square root of 1 is 1, so I'm going to make the leap here. Negative 5 plus minus 1 over 2. So I get x is negative 5 plus 1 over 2, and x is negative 5 minus 1 over 2. So x is going to be negative 5 plus 1, negative 4, divided by 2 is negative 2. And x is negative 5 minus 1 is negative 6, divided by 2, which is negative 3. Right? Speeding up some of these calculations uh, as we keep going here. OK. So in terms of my graph, right? I know that this thing, regardless of if it's up or down, uh, is going to cross at negative 2 and negative 3, right? In fact, well, I guess that was right for you, but for me, negative 2, negative 3, okay? So, uh, so I know it's going to cross, so it's got the roots at negative 2 and negative 3, so those are my cutoff points, and then what I want is I, I want to figure out what the sign of this thing is um, at each of these points. So we can rewrite this, and I'll copy it, copy. So we can rewrite this as x plus 2 times x plus 3 has to be greater than 0. Right? Using the roots, just like we were doing before when we were factoring, that's what we're doing, right? x minus 2, x minus 3, those are solutions. And so when I plug in x equals negative 2 here, I should get 0. And when I plug in x equals negative 3 here, I should get 0, right? Here we're adding the condition that it has to be greater than 0, so we have to get positive values. Right, greater than zero means we need positive values. Okay. So now I'm going to put the roots on the number line and figure out where this thing is positive on that number line. Okay. So I've got, give myself lots of room here. Negative 3, remember, is less than negative 2, so you want to make sure that you write it properly on your number line. Oops. Like that. And just visually, we can divvy up the space just so we can see what's going on here. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this again and put it in each of these regions. Okay. And then we're going to pick any value in each of these regions and figure out if the sign is positive or negative. So here we go. So I've got x plus 2 times x plus 3. And then I'm going to cheat and just use copy, paste, and paste. 
three times over. In the beginning, especially, it might be easiest if you just pick some values in here, especially because I have a hard time dealing with, with negatives. I find that they're kind of tricky sometimes. And so it might be best to, to pick an actual value. But at the end of the day, all we care about is if it's positive or negative or, or what's going on in here. So uh, if I pick, you know, x equals negative 5 here, between negative 3 and negative 2, I don't have a lot of options. I'll use negative 2 and a half just as a little check-in point. And greater than negative 2, I'm going to use my favorite x equals 0. Whenever I can, I use x equals 0 just because it makes my life so much easier. So then here, uh, maybe I'll use a different color. If x is negative 5 or something less than negative 3, then it's easier to think about, okay, well, negative 5 plus 2 gives me a negative value. Negative 5 plus 3 still gives me a negative value. So a negative times a negative makes a positive result, which if we're checking back on our uh, inequality, it satisfies the, the equation or the inequality. So this is a solution, right? Anything uh, up to negative 3. So from negative infinity to uh, negative 3 is a solution. So now, right, going and doing the same thing with negative 2 and a half in here, negative 2 and a half plus 2 is still going to give me a negative result. Negative 2 and a half plus 3 gives me a positive result. Negative times a positive makes a negative, right? Making this not a part of our solution. And because we, we understand the shape of, of um, of the parabola, right, or a, a quadratic, we know that this next part is going to be positive, but we just have to make sure we have to show it. So um, if x is 0, I get 0 plus 2 is a positive number. 0 plus 3 is a positive number. Positive times a positive gives me a positive overall, which is also part of the solution. So what I'm going to do, because I've got two parts of the solution, right, I'm going to say, okay, well, in interval notation, in interval notation, what I've got here is from negative infinity up to negative 3, but not including negative 3, I get negative infinity up to negative 3 round bracket. Or, and remember we use the little u or for set notation, so or. And that's just how you're going to link these things. Whoops. Uh, link these things is using that u. Um, or from negative 2, but not including negative 2 because it can't be equal to 0 negative 2 up to positive infinity. So that's an interval notation. Which means, kind of graphically, you can use a number line too if you want it instead, but graphically what we've got, oops, We've got roots at negative 3 and negative 2, right? Off scale, but it's all right. If it's positive here up to negative 3, and then we get negative, and then we get positive, what this thing is going to look like, right, is something like this. Nice. So, good. What I want to do is uh, I want you to try 51, especially on your own, because 
Um, we'll do it for review next day. I think it's good to review this stuff because it is really involved and, and it can be really tricky. So I'll save this one for review, but notice that everything, the zeros on one side, it's already nicely factored. The only thing is that you're gonna have three cutoff points instead of just two now, right? So what I want you to do is um, try 51, which is x plus two times x minus one times x minus three is less than or equal to zero on your own. And we will do together, do it together as review next day. So we will go through it, but uh, I want you to try it on your own and see how it goes. Okay. So as if all that stuff wasn't tricky enough, uh, let's talk about absolute value inequalities. And then I think that's good for today. So, copy. Hey. There. So, Remember absolute values? Absolute values um, take a negative value and make it positive. But when we're dealing with the absolute values and inequalities, they behave a little bit differently. And so we need to really keep track of what we're doing here. And so um, what you're gonna do to solve an inequality with an absolute value is you're gonna rewrite it from this form into its equivalent form to get rid of that absolute value, right? And then you'll be back to just working with normal inequalities without that absolute value. So the trick is to go from this absolute value inequality to its equivalent form. And notice that it's a little bit tricky because if the absolute value of x is less than c, then x is between negative c and positive c. And you can try it with pretend values, uh, but it will, it will work out. So it's fine if the absolute value is less than some number. It just means that it's between the negative and the positive of it. It changes a little bit if the absolute value is greater than some number, right? Notice that it behaves similarly if it's less than or equal to or just less than, right? Same thing, greater than or equal to uh, versus greater than. So here, if you've got a greater than sign in, in the inequality, then you're going to basically get this broken up um, interval, right? And so x is less than negative c or c is less than x. Right? So we're going to do two of these. Which ones, I wonder? I have highlighted 79 and 84. So we'll try those out, see what happens. Notice that I've picked kind of the easier one with a less than or equal to sign. So that's this situation here. But then I've also picked a greater than sign, which is this third situation here. So we're gonna have a look at how do we solve these things. But what you'll see is um, we'll quickly, once we've written it in the equivalent form, then you're back to where we started, right? Then we're just solving inequalities um, and all of these are gonna be linear inequalities because I'm not that mean. So let's see here. 79 says the absolute value of x minus five has to be less than or equal to three. Okay. So step one, write the inequality in its equivalent form. So 
So here, right, I'm going to match this. Oops. I'm going to match this to one of these, right? So if I have the absolute value of something has to be less than or equal to three, what I've got is situation two. And so I've got the absolute value of X is less than or equal to C. The equivalent form is that negative C is less than or equal to X, which is less than or equal to C. Maybe I'll move this to the middle a little bit. So if I have the absolute value of X minus five, it has to be less than or equal to three. Now my C is three and my X has been replaced with X minus five, but that's okay. So now I've got negative three has to be less than or equal to X minus five, which has to be less than or equal to positive three. But now, right now, I'm just back to a pretty simple situation like we were dealing with in the beginning. Step two, solve uh, as any other inequality. Right, keeping track of uh, if you're multiplying or dividing by a negative, but other than that, you're off to the races, right? So here, if I have to solve for X here, solve this inequality, all I have to do is add five to both sides. So what I get here is I have X minus five, I'll rewrite it out. Negative three, positive three. If I add five to both sides, I get negative three plus five has to be less than or equal to X, which has to be less than or equal to three plus five. Notice that I'm not showing the plus five in the middle anymore. Right? And that's totally fine. Negative three plus five, two has to be less than X, which has to be less than three plus five, which has to be eight. We check in and make sure that this makes sense, right? X has to be greater than two, but less than eight. That makes sense, right? Um, and you can check your work. Right? Uh, but I'm going to leave that to the reader, as, uh, as some cheeky textbooks say. So, um, so once you've written it in its equivalent form, then you're just back to a regular inequality. So now let's do 84, which is going to be a little bit more work, but not a, not a whole lot more work. 84, the absolute value of 8x plus 3 has to be greater than 12. The equivalent form of the absolute value greater than some value is that, and I'll copy this here, copy, and put it down here. So the equivalent form for this is going to be that x which is being replaced with 8x plus 3, right? That anything inside the, the absolute value you just treat as one thing and then you're able to solve for the actual x. So the equivalent form is 8x plus 3 has to be less than negative 12 or 12 has to be less than 8x plus 3. Solve these individually. So we get 8x plus 3 has to be less than negative 12. And maybe I'll put it over to the left hand side a little bit more and kind of solve these side by side. 12 has to be less than 8x plus 3. Working on the left hand side first, I have to solve for x. So I'm going to add, uh, sorry, subtract 3 from both sides and then I'm going to divide by positive 8. So I don't have to switch the sign here, which is nice. So I get 8x is less than negative 12 minus 3. So just be careful. Negative 12 minus 3 is negative 15. 
So x must be less than negative 15 divided by 8. If I do that on my calculator, it looks like it's uh, reduced already, so that's nice. Now I'm going to solve for x on this side, and I'm going to have 12 minus 3. 12 minus 3 puts me at 9. Has to be less than 8x. So x, 9 divided by 8. Right, I'm dividing by 8 on both sides to solve for x. 8 is positive, and so um, I don't have to switch the sign. Okay, so x has to be less than negative 15 over 8, or, uh, or x has to be greater than 9 over 8, right? And it's easier to put these things on a number line, right? If we, um, if we convert them to decimals. I want them in exact form like this, right? But it will be easier to visualize our solution if we use a number line with the decimal approximations. So what we'll do here is I convert negative 15 divided by 8 into a decimal. That's roughly negative 1.875. 9 divided by 8 is approximately 1.125. So it'll be easier to put these on a number line and it sounds like I really need to take my dog outside. She's prancing like crazy but we're so close, we're so close. So uh, let's just finish this up so I can take her outside. Um, oh, she heard me. Our solution, right, x has to be less than this value. So here, but not including that value. And x has to be greater than, right, we have to be careful how we read this. x has to be larger than 9 over 8, which is larger than 1.125. So here, this is our solution. Okay. So in interval notation, we have from negative infinity up to negative 15 over 8, or, which is that u union, or from 9 over 8 up to positive infinity. A little bit harder, right? But once you have that equivalent form, then you're good to go. Are there any questions? If so, ask quick, because my dog is desperate to get outside. I know I heard your stomach gurgling this whole time. Okay, then I will stop this recording.